Welcome everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. My name is Johanna. I'm from the Renewables Grid Initiative and um, I'm very happy to welcome you on another installment of our webinar series on good practices that we are lucky to jointly co-organize with ENSOE, who is also here today to say hello. Today we are going to look at a very interesting tool. It's called a 3D decision support system. It was, was developed together um, by SwissGrid and the ETH Zurich. And it's a tool that improves planning decisions when you plan new routes for power transmission lines. Now we're going to have a quick look at the agenda. This is what is going to happen today. I'm going to say very briefly, hi, who we are, why we do this. And then we have a welcome by um, the ENSOE Secretary General Laurent Schmidt, which we're very happy to have to here today. Um, and then we have uh, Joram Skito and Joshua Julier from uh, Swiss Grid and ETH Zurich, who will um, introduce the practice to you. And then we'll have lots of time for questions afterwards, uh, so you can ask everything that you are uh, have been wondering or questions that came up. Before we start, we are recording this webinar so that you can show it to your colleagues later um, and we, it's going to go up on our YouTube channel and then on our website as well. There's also in this tool that you see on the side in the um, where you can see who's attending, um, there's a document where we have put the PDF of the presentation so that you can download it. It's under documents to the right. Now, to the Renewables Grid Initiative. Most of us will know you, but just briefly for those who don't, we are um, an association of 23 now, TSOs and NGOs, and we want to further the energy transition and have more renewables in the system by building grids in a transparent and environmentally sensitive way. This is our memberships, and as you can see, they are from all over Europe. One of our core activities is sharing good practices. We do this because we firmly believe in the value of sharing good practices that may then inspire future grid projects and make them better. And we have several different ways of doing this. We have a database, we have publications on this, we do learning journeys, we have an award with three categories. Um, we also have workshops and where you are today, we have webinars where we share good practices. Now, I would love to um, hand over to Laurent Schmidt and so he's Secretary General for some welcoming words. Okay, so thank you, Joanna, for inviting me today to introduce your very interesting webinar. Uh, at NSOE, we are very happy to support AGI in organizing this webinar to uh, further help disseminate how our TSO community is, uh, is working on their important uh, grid expansion projects. Uh, as most of you know, um, introducing more renewable into our system requires three things, upgrading the system, updating the market design, as well as uh, finding new ways uh, to operate the system uh, with large amount of uh, renewable and all our members are very implied on these uh, three aspects. Uh, but across the three aspects, grid expansions remain up to now the most cost-efficient way uh, to introduce uh, renewables and achieve the European climate targets on time. Uh, if we, uh, if we uh, don't do this expansion, the uh, European could pay as much as 40 billion extra in their power bill if uh, due to lack of uh, power grids, uh, more than 150 terawatt hours of green electricity could be lost and wasted uh, due to curtailments and uh, yeah, difficulties of managing security of supply if uh, we do, don't do this expansion. So uh, these expansions are, are really at the core of uh, the uh, introduction of renewable into the system. So this is why our members, such as uh, here today, we're going to hear about Swiss Grid, are really trying to find new inno innovative, innovative ways uh, to inform, involve communities in the building up of these transmission projects, which are, as what I said, essential for society as, as a whole. And making use of uh, digital technology, we are going to, to, to hear today 
about how can the digital technology help into this uh, um, uh, optimized planning. Uh, so we, uh, I would like to wish all participants a great webinar and really encourage you to visit our nsoe.eu website and connect with us in social media to learn more on the work which our TSO members are doing uh, uh, to, uh, to enhance uh, our power systems and of course contribute and, uh, and provide uh, best ideas uh, to do this in the future. So very much looking forward to the outcome of this webinar and, uh, and all the best for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, before I hand over the presenters, I um, wanted to just briefly explain to you how this um, works for the questions. If you have any questions during the presentation on the panel, you can put them into, uh, there's a question button or also in the chat, and then afterwards I will read them out. Now, um, we are very excited uh, to have uh, Joram and Joshu um, present this practice. It's a 3D tool that weighs in different stakeholders' interests and it can have a huge impact on finding a consensus solution and finding actually the opti most optimal route for everyone involved. So with that said, um, we are very excited to see how it works and what your experience has been so far. And I will just briefly hand over the screen to you. Show my screen. Do you see the presentation now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Joram Skito from ETH Zurich and I, Joshua Julie from Swissquit, we welcome you to this RGI webinar about the 3D decision support system for planning power lines. Before we go into the details, I will come to the context. Um, I'm working for the Swiss transmission system operator, TSO, in Switzerland, Swiss grid. We have the 380 and 220 kilovolt grid. We own it. And this means we operate it, we maintain it, and we also expand it and modernize it. And I will come now to this modernization with also Lauren Schmidt also mentioned before. In Switzerland, the picture is similar than in whole Europe. We have existing bottlenecks. A big part of our lines are from the 1950s and 1960s. And for another time, not for the energy transition. So we have to modernize the grid to make it, uh, to prepare it for the energy transition. And in Switzerland, if you look at the bottlenecks, we have a bottleneck between north and south. We have a region in south um, here. This is the Valle. Valle is a mountainous region with a lot of hydropower, and the energy has to be transported to the north, to the consumption region, Zurich, Bern, Lucerne, and all, all these cities. And there we have a, a big bottleneck. Now uh, we have to expand the grid and there, if we if we look at the reasons or the drivers for grid expansion in Switzerland, we can identify three main drivers. The first driver is the the our new ex, new large power plants, as for example the 900 megawatt pump storage Nonderance, also in the region of Valle, which the energy of this plant have to be transported as well to the regions in the north. Then uh, the second driver is import, export and transit. This is also very important for Switzerland because in Switzerland we import electricity in winter and we export in summer. Then the third driver is the supply of the distribution grids. Also we have to connect the transmission grid with the distribution grid and also lines are necessary for that. And this leads us to following map of 10 important grid expansion projects. And 
these, these projects are necessary until 2025. And what we can see that already now is that we won't reach this target now because uh, there are some projects we will reach uh, 2025 the, to finish them, but a lot we, we won't finish. And to give you uh, an example for a large delay, I will just say you uh, the Chamoson Shippis project, which is also important for the connection of the pump storage non de -Drance. There uh, we received the approval to construct in 2017 after 31 years of planning and approval process. And why are these delays? You see already here, you see some houses below lines. Some of you wouldn't uh, be disturbed of it, but if we ask the population, a, a big part uh, perceive high volume. Johan, we cannot hear you. Uh, Josh, you can, we cannot hear you anymore. <laughs> Joshua. Oh, not there. There. Oh. Okay, I'm very sorry. We're going to try to fix this. Not sure what happened there. into consideration all these uh, perceptions and problems and also interests of stakeholders. We, we um, have developed the 3D decision support system for planning power lines. The, 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 op, the, the main objective is to find the solution with the highest acceptance among all stakeholders. And we do this with a multi-criteria decision analysis uh, which uh, allow to include all these interests and all the important factors to construct a new line. Joram will go more in detail after in that. And in the end, the product will also help us because it visualizes the lines or also the corridors um, for the direct affected individuals and we can show the line to, to them on information events and so uh, can decrease the fears as well with these visualizations. And now this project is made by two institutes at ETH Zurich and together with industrial partners as for example, we Swiss Grid. And at this point, I will hand over to Joram Skito. He will explain you this silver bullet this silver bullet, the 3D decision support system. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. As Yoshu told before, it's all about choice. We have to decide which route we want to go for the future power transmission line. Which means in our case, as we focus in a study area in central, central Switzerland, between Innerkirchen in the south and Mettland in the north, that's a project together with Swiss Grid. You see on the, on the sheet that there are lots of possibilities. You have the west possibility, then two in the center, two east possibilities. But the question now arises, how disruptive, how risky or how expensive are these, these corridors, these solutions? And we, we want to tackle this. We want to tackle this not just for overhead lines, but also for earth cables in future. That's our main objective. And we take into consideration the technical feasibility, as well as environment and landscape issues, as well as planning. And the concept behind it's everything about multi-criteria decision analysis, a very long term with a very long tradition. It's a tool set of mathematical roots in order to find the best solution among different stakeholders. And we combine this with geographic information systems. The main questions I want to, to answer you today are these. The first is, how can we achieve 
realistic modeling. That's also one of my personal goals in my PhD project in order to enhance the degree of realism of the modeled re results. The second question is how can overhead lines be combined with earth cables? This is an issue we are tackling now and we are working on a solution which should be interesting also because it, it, it uses a very novel approach in this regard. Okay, some words to the 3D DSS project. D what does DSS mean? Yeah, but it's, it's very simple. DSS means it is a decision support system. It's meaning a system which aids decision makers to get a, a good intention which which choice should be done in the end with the least amount of post decision regret that's the definition decision support system and therefore we also called the project we are working on 3d dss that's our link to our homepage it's 3d dss.ethz.ch you can also follow us on, on twitter with the latest news on 3d dss underscore ethz okay so far, what exactly are we doing? If uh, you plan, as you know, um, an overhead line or, or a nerve cable, then you start with a very broad study area and then you narrow down this area that more, the longer the more. Uh, you go to the planning area and then you have to decide what exactly you want to plan. Either you plan uh, an overhead line or a nerve cable. And we are right now able to compute the whole overhead, overhead line section up to the very exact pylons position, which takes a bit of computing time, but um, yeah, and, and is thought for the, the, end, uh, the end phase of this decision making process. Whereas, on the other hand, we are currently working on combining both approaches, the overhead together with the earth cable approach in order to compute also reliable and realistic earth cable corridors. And we are working on the lower branch right now. So some words how our system works. I told you before MCDA, that's multi-criteria decision analysis. This is a tool set, a mathematical tool set in order to get the optimal result from, uh, from a task with or either uh, different layers, different data, or different participants which want to solve this problem. And we combine this together with a um, tool or an approach called least cost path analysis. And the concept behind is that first you have to consider laws, acts, and pro protected areas, which are protected by law, and you give them some costs. You use, you, 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 define a specific amount of costs so that it the future line shouldn't pass this area which, which is very costly. So costly areas should be avoided, whereas cheap areas in terms of virtual costs should be preferred. The second key concept is, as I told you before, that the, if costs are low, then the suitability for a new power line accordingly is high. These two concept to, concepts together, we put into a frame, into a system in order to compute the solution automatically. So here, short presentation, how it works. We base the whole system on so-called georeferenced data, which means geodata. That's our protected areas. You see gra green, this could represent some forests and purple streets and you can add also lakes and water bodies on the top and so on and so on. What you want to protect, what you mean is worth it to protect, you add to the system. In the second phase, you generate by applying a specific MCDA formula um, cost surface, which means that it accumulates the costs for in, in or, based on your um, decision or based on your interests and you use what you want exactly to protect, how much, and then the total cost sum is uh, derived from this. And we derive 
by means of an optimization algorithm, in the end, the, co the most feasible co corridor. The more yellow the area is, the more suitable the solution is. So let's go to a live demo. Okay, that's our tool. And you see the, the air on the left, different categories. As I told you before, landscape and environment protection, living environment and urban planning and constru construction and maintenance. And here you have, uh, as, as you define it, or as we defined it uh, together with Swissgrid in our project here in central Switzerland, we have different layers and categories like, um, reserves, protected areas, geotopes, mires, forests, and so on. And you could uh, easily change the weight in order, uh, based on your interest, how much you want to protect this specific area. And you can define uh, resistance according to the, to the legal base. And you can do this for, in our model, we have right now 33 such factors. But uh, it's 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 open because the algorithm doesn't take so long to to compute the solution, which means you choose a specific algorithm. We in our case chose uh, simple additive weighting. Click on the button. This is real time. That's live. Real time. It has been computed. Then second click. That's real time. We can blend off the cost surface and the system suggests now this corridor here in the east of this lake here makes a turn here around this mountain and then it goes here it, it surpasses Lucerne here is Lucerne and it, and it goes northwards and uh, eastwards to the station you can also compute the costs it will cost uh, based on our estimation of totally 147 millions of francs. So what I want to present you now, okay, you, so this is very simple, very easy. You could also um, change to 3D mode, but in the end, important is to define together with the stakeholders a mathematical formula which you want to apply because we now applied sharp edges, but you could also take continuous edges and then compare the one solution with sharp edges to the new solution with, aha, uh -huh. here you are. Because by considering, and I will explain this concept later on, you, you find different corridors, which means that the, the, the corridor here in the east of the lake is blend out because in under this circumstances, under this consideration of this specific model, um, other other variety or other alternatives come into question. Let's say by going through this valley or by passing the lake on the west side, which means this tool is very powerful in generating different alternatives, which then could be discussed later on together with stakeholders. So also this solution could be computed. Now we switch to 3D mode. Okay, 3D mode. It's, we have a very slow connection today. I beg your pardon. Yes, it's very slow. You can also zoom into the whole landscape. Yeah, it lags. It lags a little bit because we are using so many different tools today. Here we are. Okay, you could shift it. You can can, you can you can also blend in. We have also uh, 3D LiDAR data, which is highly resoluted here into the model. And you can then compare the old line, which was estimated to be the, the optimal choice here, as my mouse cursor is right now, or the new, the new here in the east. But now I beg your pardon because of the slow internet connection, but here, yeah, yeah. Right now it should work a bit better. Yeah, and here you see. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I suggest to go on 
because um, of, of this very slow internet connection. I'm sorry. Well, some words to current results and work. What did we find out? What are we currently working on? The main point, as I told you before, what my main interest is, is to make the whole decision model as most realistic as possible. That's my personal intention I have. So here, decision makers want to choose between a few possibilities, a few alternatives, not millions, because the, the computer or the system can generate millions of possibilities. But which is then, in the end, really the best solution? Which means we must redefine the whole question and ask how much the decision model be defined in order to compute clear distinguishable alternatives. And we were explicitly interested in which parameters control this distingu distinguishability. So we found it out. We know that the boundary model, as I explained you before, by considering or sharp edges or continuous edges, that's the most influential parameter, followed by the mathematical model you applied, MCDA method. And these both represent concerns of citizens. You can tackle by, uh, by applying this tool, perhaps on a, on a workshop together with citizens when you are in, in informing uh, affected citizens about the future project. So one key result is our world as it is, is continuous. It is not sharp, it is continuous because we know it that the um, results are more reliable if you consider uh, continuous borders. That's one point. As you see there on the right, continuous instead of sharp edged. That's one key result we have. The second is simply KISS. KISS means keep it short and simple. As you keep your decision model as short and as simple as possible, you can also explain it transparently and very simply to the stakeholders involved in the whole decision process. And we also know from our mathematical models that these models, which are most easiest, are also the most reliable models. So our recommendation is keep it simple. Keep it very simple in order that add it at the, the weights and the resistances simply up, explain it very simply, and also the utility functions, uh, which means that if you ask a question, whether this is, this is uh, feasible or a very feasible, feasible medium or not feasible and extremely not feasible. So take into consideration that people think very easily so that feasible, very feasible is double as much as feasible, for example. So, let's go on. We also conducted a study with 10 planning experts during the last months, and we asked the participants whether they could define an ideal scenario based on their personal interests. And at the same time, we asked participants whether they could draw um, a line which they have in mind, which mentally represents their opinion best. There, you see them, you see all these drawn lines on the left side. Our model then computed without that participants knew the solution computed by the model. We then confronted the participants with the models we computed. You see them on the right. And you see that we are very, very accurate. So our tool finds, in the yeah, plus or minus, it finds really all the solutions. We have uh, to state at this point that the, um, the green lines, which went through the middle, this shouldn't be considered in future because of legal legal prerequisites. Prerequis so, in the middle on the left, you see there, this, this area shouldn't be considered. And then we ask also, oh, uh, listen, you see this green line, you passed here a protection area, but we computed to uh, that is that, that it would be better for you to pass here through this canyon. Would you agree in changing your opinion? And yes, indeed, some participants were, were agreed in changing their mind, changing their opinion in order to abandon which was proposed by the three DSS. And we also got very, uh, very good feedback. We wanted to know 
whether our system is accurate, professional, re uh, realistic, objective, transparent, complete, supportive, and supports communication. And uh, green, on the left side, you see, all, you see always what participants expected, and then orange, what the, what the end answer was. And we are very confident in the, that we are on the right way because we are uh, in median, uh, always above average. And also concerning attractive, uh, attractiveness, perspicuity, effectiveness, dependability, and stimulation, novelty, we are always here in the positive and green fields. So, the other thing we, we did was we tested uh, graphical outputs because we have, as you saw before, the maps and we have these uh, visualizations, but we also tested uh, in to what extent different kinds of visualizations could be helpful, as you see on the right side, the um, spider chart. And indeed, spider chart was very supportive, as we got uh, as a feedback from our participants, and this representation helped um, considering or reconsidering and improving the defined scenario which the participants defined in advance. And it also is very helpful for evaluating the corridor modeled by the 3D DSS. However, totally on the right, you see that the, um, ca the capability of changing the opinion is uh, limited, which means that we should work and we will work in future on improving this um, capability to, to change the user's opinion towards a better or even better or even more optimal solution. The next steps, furthermore, are we want to combine, as I told you before, the algorithm which computes overhead lines with earth cables. Because if you have a look here, this is a villa located in central Switzerland at the uh, lake of Lucerne. And there in this, uh, in this town, a very famous DJ millionaire lives there and many millionaires. And they don't want that, um, that the power line passes behind their backyard. That's the NIMBY phenomenon. Other people suggest to bundle um, the new line with existing lines in order to keep the, the general loads as least as possible. So now the question arises, where should then the transition buildings between the overhead lines and the earth cables be located? That's one of the main questions. And we have an approach we want to test in the near future. We first determine a, an area of high stress level where this could be um, an advantage to build earth cables in. Second, we define or we search at the border of this, of this area which come into question for ideal places where these transition buildings could be located. And then third, we compute the optimal earth cable corridor between these transition stations within this area of a high stress level. And then from these transition buildings, we go to the, um, to the connection points at the start and in the end. And we, and, um, yeah, we're looking forward to tackle this issue. So, we are open for questions. This is Joshua Julie. My name is Joram Skito. We thank you in advance for your questions and thank you for your attention. If you have questions, write us an email. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, now, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Now we still have some time for questions um, in here. And I already uh, received two about um, I can see there's a lot more coming in now, but there's two that I wanted to ask you about how to deal with stakeholders. Now, firstly, how do you price in the potential protests of citizens? Do you do interviews, surveys, or do you analyze um, other projects and the acceptance there? Is there a way of pricing this? Yeah, in, during the studies, we involve different stakeholders coming from, from, uh, from national uh, governmental authorities and of planning experts at this step. And in the past also we considered NGOs, different NGOs like landscape planning or nature, nature conservation. And uh, uh, up to now we didn't involve affected citizens. And the main reason for this is that 
um, the planning stage in which we are in which we act is a very early planning stage because the goal the main objective we have is to find different corridor or alternatives which then should be should be decided on and then in, an, in another step should be should be discussed also with the citizens which might be affected by building the power line yes and we can also discuss after the, when we define some corridor alternatives we can discuss the alternatives in uh, information events with invited uh, direct affected individuals and uh, planning um, uh, planning associations and then we can get the feedback uh, to the decision group to the decision support group which helps to to decide after the the federal council to decide which corridor is the most important one advantage of the approach is also that mcda allows to include different uh, opinions by different stakeholders so this whole this whole approach could be extended in that way that um, that different opinions could be matched together or that in order the, to find a very best solution that um, that some alternatives are sorted out so that stakeholders can focus on the important things which means that we we found out in the past during lots of of workshops that stakeholders began to discuss and to debate whether whether this should be a um, resistance of five instead of four but in the end the, the the difference was very little so our suggestion is to pre-build the the whole model and then to focus on the very important parts and yeah a decision support system or also the computing uh, procedure can support stakeholders in finding these very basic alternatives in, from the beginning on. And to, dis and to discuss after these alternatives with the stakeholders, the tool should help us. And uh, to find, finally, we always say the Swiss compromise. This is the solution which everyone could live with, but it's not. It, it, it doesn't exist the best solution because there are always people. There are always some interests which which will be not be respected or less respected. I have also a rather technical question. Um, did you also implement other MCDA methods other than uh, SAW? Which one did they give you different results? Yeah, thank you very much. This is a very good question. We did, indeed. We tested three different. We had uh, simple additive weighting, which uh, other experts call it weighted linear combination. It's the same. And we also tested because the problem on, or the, the conceptual problem, conceptual problem is that if you, the, the more layers or the more areas or factors you define, the less important and the less influential these single layers become. So you must be very careful when deciding on which factors you want to include into the decision model. This is the, um, the negative part of uh, simple additive weighting because it does it, it, it simply adds all values up. We also tested based on this, we tested um, an approach with logarithmic logarith which adds a logarithm. On, on the whole sum in order to put down areas which are uh, covered multiple times. And, um, and the third we tested was a maximum approach that we took the maximum out of each category because we said, okay, that's the more, then we leave out the others. And we found out that um, the, the difference is very low between simple additive weighting and this logarithm logar with the eight with add a logarithm on it. And the maximum should be also avoided because the results are not uh, not realistic enough. So we uh, assume or we suggest to use simple additive weighting. Based on this, also we we thought about to to include different uh, different MCDA methods as the MCDA, med, uh, MCDA experts call them. We also used uh, different different technique how to ask the, the values and the resistances and weights from participants. And there we, we, we used analytic hierarchy process. And we also found out that between the direct rating method, we used 
up to now and the uh, analytic hierarchy process the difference is so low that uh, th that it's much easier to apply the, um, the the direct rating which means that you directly set up the resistance and the weight in the graphical user interface because it's much easier and the result is almost the same okay um Thanks for that. Um, I have two questions here about birds. So I know you have environmental protection as a factor in there. Do you also specifically factor in bird mortality and when they could fly into the um, overhead lines, the flyways, the flight paths? Thank you for the question. We th This topic also was discussed lots of times. We do also consider uh, bird protection areas, but as I told you before, the decision model, that's one part we have to really to carefully consider together with our partners as SwissGrid. However, the other thing is that we are also bound on the data we get. So we, in, for the case in Switzerland, we have uh, areas which are really specified as bird protection areas. And, uh, and th that's a data set we could download and we, and we still use. The, but we, we don't model exactly how, how, how much probabilities for birds that they fly into the, the new overhead line. But it, it, it was a very good idea to implement this in future. And I have another question here for Swiss Grid. I think. Um, does this impact the average time span between thinking and designing the line and actually building it? So does it improve the speed of project implementation? This is what we hope. I can't say if it does because we didn't use it until now, but with this project, Metlen Innerkirchen, which, which we saw before, uh, which is the case area for this 3D decision support system, we would want to test it and we want to use it for different projects exactly also to, 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 to get easier the, the two most important or three most important alternatives and to discuss these few alternatives after in the decision uh, group and after also in the second step with the direct affected individuals and municipalities in the in the in the face of the trust if you in the face of the track if we look at the path of the line but in at the moment we don't have experience but this is the goal this is the objective to to decrease the time and do you think uh, there has been a couple of questions about transferability do you think this tool can be used in other countries do you know there's any examples already yeah, thank you for, for the question. In the past, we worked together with APG, which is the TSO of Austria. So we did also studies in Austria. And currently, we are also doing studies in Belgium together with ELIA and in the city of Zurich, uh, yeah, we're together with EWZ. So uh, all these this areas in Switzerland and in, in Austria were very challenging because they included also a very challenging topography and we are sure that yeah the, the this, this approach is transferable to other regions and the, the point is that we must also re rely on the data we got and uh, and the and data sets you can download from from inventories or for from public domains from from the government so the better the, the data the the, the database is, which we use, the better and more, the more reliable the results are. So the data is where we begin, where we start. Okay, thank you very much. I think we should come to an end now because we are already over time. Um, so thank you so much for uh, presenting and answering the questions. And I, I think you are available for further questions. Um, you shared the... Um, your website and the Twitter handle earlier and I will also send out a feedback survey to everyone that participated today it would be really nice to take short time for three to four questions and um, again distribute where you can find more information and ask more questions with that thank you very much and I hope everybody is going to have a fantastic week bye thank bye you. thank you very much bye, bye.